Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, you are here with for the celebrating 50 years of excellence, UWSP's College of Natural Resources Spring Seminar Series, and we are and we have Omar Milan joining us tonight. But before we get to our speaker, I first would like to say um, my name is Jennifer Summers. I'm the Program Development Specialist with the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife, and we. Um, have co-organized this seminar series along with the College of Natural Resources. So I'd like to just say a few thank yous to Stacy Allen Bonnick in particular. She was with the college, uh, she's with the college, excuse me, the College of Natural Resources, and she helped me or helped us prepare this, this seminar series. And she was very integral to getting this series going. So I'd like to thank her. I'd also like to thank the CNR faculty discipline and department coordinators. Um, each of these people played a pivotal role in helping us identify speakers and help it kind of helped us pull this seminar series together. So I'd like to thank them for their collaboration and for their, uh, for their time and for their input on this seminar series. And then this is a agreement that we have that we like to share with each time that we have a public gathering, including virtual gatherings. We recognize the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point occupies lands of the Ho-Chunk and Menominee people. Please take a moment to acknowledge and honor the ancestral Ho-Chunk and Menominee land and the sacred land of all indigenous peoples. And so with that, um, I would like to say that this is part uh, this is the, the, the second to third to last seminar of this seminar series. Uh, next week, we have uh, Suzanne uh, Belfus. She's going to be joining us, and she's an industrial forester. Uh, and so she'll be talking about her experience as a UWSP forestry alumni. And so, or alumna, excuse me. So consider joining us for that. And then I'd like to move on and introduce Scott Hingstrom, who's the director of the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife. And he will be talking a little bit about the history of the College of Natural Resources and why we're here today. Thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone, and I welcome you here to this CNR Spring Semester or Seminar Series. It is uh, really a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the College of Natural Resources. And uh, we all know that the CNR is the biggest and the best in the nation, um, but uh, it's kind of fun to look back at, at, and figure out where we've come from. Um, so in 1937, Charles Watson, he taught the first course in conservation at UW Stevens Point. Um, in 1946, Fred Schmeekley came on the scene and he uh, developed a, a department of conservation education here. And many of you recognize that name Schmeekley for Schmeekley Reserve. Um, and that department of conservation education eventually became known of, as the Department of Natural Resources in 1968 which then transitioned into the College of Natural Resources in 1971. And at that time, we hired our first dean of the college, Dr. Daniel O. Trainer. And uh, many of you know of Daniel Trainer, and uh, we actually named our building after, after him, the uh, Trainer Natural Resources Building. Um, and so here we are 50 years later, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of CNR at UWSP. Um, we have an outstanding slate of, of uh, presenters, from a wide range of CNR disciplines and from decades. And I hope you're going to be able to enjoy them. Um, I am curious, we, we did have someone here. Is Karen here to introduce our speaker? Karen Biasco was set up to help us with the introduction, but she must have gotten held up. So, so uh, well, I just met uh, Omar here about a few minutes ago, but I know all about him now, and I'm gonna give it my best shot at it. Um, Omar, he is a UWSP uh, graduate from 2020 in chemical engineering, so he's a very recent graduate. Um, and uh, he is now a processing engineer with BPM Incorporated. And Omar is going to speak with us about, uh, about paper. So I'm going to turn it over to you with that simple introduction. Omar Malan. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, Jennifer, as well. Hi, everybody. My name is Omar Mullen. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, get to speak. Um, first off, I'd like to thank uh, all of the, the people from the paper science and chemical engineering program for uh, pushing my name forward and allowing me to be one of the speakers for the, uh, for the, the, the youngest of the decades that are getting to speak. Um, it's a great honor and uh, it's uh, definitely a, an honor to graduate from the from the College of Natural Resources at, at department at UWSP. And uh, today, what I'd like to talk about is 
a little bit about myself, where I come from, what I like to do for fun, um, how my experience was at point, and then we'll kind of taper into a little bit more about the paper industry, what I've learned uh, throughout my tenure in the industry. And over the past two or three months, I, um, I actually have interviewed other people, older people, younger people, middle-aged people, and, and tried to get their take on their thoughts of the industry and how it's changed over time. So we'll have a, uh, a unique and, and broad perspective that I'll be speaking about today. So uh, I'm gonna screen share right now and begin to start my PowerPoint. All right, so evolving in a changing paper industry. Okay, so I'm going to just give you a little outline of, of what we're gonna talk about. I know I did today, but this is a little bit more formal. So I'll introduce myself. I will talk about my time as a pointer, give a little bit of insight on how I chose my major and my career, um, talk about my industry experience, talk about some of the changes within, within the industry and also talk about the future of paper products. So just a brief introduction about myself. Uh, my hometown is Dearborn, Michigan, uh, right outside of Detroit. It's a town of about 100,000 people. So a little bit larger than Stevens Point. Uh, I have a mother, a father, older sister, and a younger brother. My older sister, she works for Ford Motor Company. And my younger brother is a business major. He plays college football for Albion University, which is a small private school in lower Michigan. So one thing that has been with me since I was really young is my passion for hockey. I played junior hockey, I played college hockey, and I still play full contact hockey to this day. With all of that, I've been able to, blessed and able to travel all over the country and even the world in some cases. I played junior hockey. I, I started in Amarillo, Texas. I then moved to Johnstown, Pennsylvania. I then moved to Wenatchee, Washington. I then moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, then to Stevens Point, and now I'm here in Pesciu. So hockey has taken me to many different places. I've got to see many different towns, paper towns even, um, many different people, how they operate, cultures, and it's, it's been an absolute blessing because it's helped me communicate with people in, the, in, in life and in the industry as well. As far as my hobbies go, I'm a pretty simple Midwesterner when it comes to that. I love to fish. My favorite type of fishing is trolling for walleye out of my boat. I got a, I got a nice 18 footer and uh, that, that's, my, that's my happy time is when I'm, when I'm out fishing. I do hunt as well. I like all types of hunting. So that occupies a fair amount of my time too. And uh, I love to golf. That is now that my my body's getting a little bit older and, and hockey is ending. It's hockey is ending, is coming to its end. Uh, golf is kind of what's going to occupy my time from an athletic standpoint moving forward. And just this year when I moved to Peshigo, I signed up to be in a bowling league and I absolutely love it. It's uh, I actually have bowling tonight uh, after after this presentation and, and I can't wait to get out there and go bowling. So. Yeah, that's a little bit about me. And like I said before, I, I live in, in Peshigo, Wisconsin now. So that's about two hours from, from Stevens Point. I am right on the Green Bay. So that's where I do most of my walleye, walleye fishing. So to talk about my time as a pointer, I think that there are three words that can sum it up very simply. I, can, I could talk and I will talk a little bit more in depth about them. But number one, busy. Between studying chemical engineering, uh, playing hockey for the pointers, I, I played for one year for the pointers hockey team, and balancing a social life, the only other time I really had was to eat and sleep. And that was not a bad thing. I really enjoyed every moment of my time as a pointer. And it was a little busy, a little stressful at times, but being able to get through it 
and see the opportunities that it gave me, it was definitely worth the busy time. Uh, engaging is another easy way to describe my time at UWSP. Every single day I went to class, uh, whether it be uh, a more general ed education class or strictly tapered to my degree, my major, I was able to learn something. I, I tried to be as much like a sponge as I could and, and soak up as much information as I could. And, and the unique part about that was that it didn't necessarily come just from my teachers. I learned a, a large amount of information from my students. It, it was one of, the, one of the greatest parts about studying engineering, I'd say, is that I surrounded myself with people as smart or smarter than me. And, and that was just an awesome thing to be able to be around those types of minds, see how they operate, see how they work through problems and, and take some of that information and, and infiltrate it into my everyday life. And rewarding, I think this is probably the, the number one way to sum up my time at UWSP. I, I spent a little bit of time at Milwaukee School of Engineering before I transferred to Stevens Point and that was wonderful. But being at a liberal arts school was great because you know I, I studied a, a very mathematical or scientific major but being able to be around other types of people with other types of interests was, was wonderful because you get to see different people express themselves in different ways. So I, I think that that was a, a great thing to take again into the industry and into the real world and, and understanding how to work with people that might not be exactly the same as you. And it, it, was, it was a great time being at UWSP. So this is gonna bring out a little bit more of the, the engineering side of me, I'd say. I, I like to think of myself as a very analytical thinker. Uh, don't get me wrong, there's always times to abort that. Life is, is, a, is a precious thing, it's a unique thing, it's an artistic thing. So the, the answer isn't always able to be taken care of on, on paper, in my opinion. So this is my disclaimer to my title here, choosing a major an analytical approach, you have to be willing to navigate as you go. Um, that, that's one thing that I've, I've always looked at is said, okay, here's the plan. This is what I wanna do. But at any moment in time, I'm allowed to change that plan. So having a sense of direction, but also, be, also being able to move away from that and, and seek other opportunities is something that I currently do, I used to do, and I suggest that other people consider as well when either choosing a major or choose, choosing a career moving forward. Um, another thing is understanding that that's okay. Uh, if you wanna be a doctor or you wanna be an actress or an actor or an artist and it doesn't necessarily pan out, it's okay. You're allowed to, you're allowed to find something that works for you and, and it could have been your dream for so long, but life has a funny way of, of, of navigating and, and flowing and, finding out what makes best sense for you. Uh, the great example of that is when I was 21 after junior hockey, I started as a freshman and I was business, business, business. This is what I want to do. I want to get my four-year degree, go immediately into business. Well, after a year of that, it changed. Biomedical engineering, the electronics, the robotics really piqued my interest, perked my interest. And I was gung-ho about that for a year. And when the opportunity came to potentially transfer to Stevens Point to play hockey, I actually said, okay, let me take a look and see what's going on at Stevens Point. Okay, they have a paper science and engineering program. That seems interesting. What's it all about? Kind of took a look into it and noticed that they had a chemical engineering program. Began to do some more research and turned out that Stevens Point had everything that I wanted from a college. So that was kind of how I got to getting into chemical engineering or through all of my, my previous process before that. And one thing that I've always done as well is think about my end game and where do I want to be in five years? Where do I want to be in 10 years, 25 years, 50 years is knowledge the only thing that matters is knowledge and money combined something that matters and I asked myself those questions and I was able to find that uh, an engineering degree would be able to solve 
as best as it could everything that I'm looking for in a career and beyond. Some of the questions I asked myself throughout this approach was, and I think the most important was, what do I enjoy? And when it comes to a work atmosphere and really just a, a, any type of personal communication with other people, I really enjoy problem solving. I love working in groups. If I had the choice to go do something by myself or take two or three others, work on it together and come to a solution, I'd pick the group work 10 times out of 10. And the other thing is innovation. I love seeing a product start as a brainstorming stage, uh, maybe not even realistic in some people's eyes and working together with other people to watch that product come to life. Uh, it's something that really excites me. Uh, the other thing that I did when I, when I chose my major was I analyzed the job rate upon graduation. Uh, UWSP, chemical engineering and paper science have a 99% placement rate after, after graduation. Uh, I personally had my job after my senior or my junior year, I interned and I actually went into my senior year in September with a full-time job already signed here at BPM. And I'm not the only one that had that opportunity. There were plenty of people that had the opportunity to, to sign on the jobs, had three or four different offers. So that was something that I looked at as well. I also looked at the opportunity for advancement within the industry that I chose. Uh, the paper industry in general has a older age population nearing retirement. And we'll talk about that a little bit later once we get more into the industry, but when you see uh, people in, in management that are hitting that 59, 60, 61 year old range, it's, it's uh, pretty easy to see that some, somebody is going to need to fill those positions. And I, I looked at that as, as a great opportunity to move up in, in an industry that has been, uh, that is, is very fulfilling for people that can get to those positions. And, the last and another very important point is, will I be challenged in this major? And the answer to that is absolutely. I remember my, my first exam, I walked out of that class. I was paper science and engineering 215, thinking there was no chance that I could ever be an engineer and got the test score back. It wasn't the best score ever, but I do remember Dr. Biasca saying, hey, to, to the whole class, this is a tough class. You have to work through it. You have to understand what failure is before you can, before you can understand what success is. And, and that was something that kept me going, but uh, definitely the engineering degree at UWSP was challenging every day. So I'd like to talk a little bit about my industry experience. Uh, currently I am a process and converting engineer at BPM Inc. We're in Peshtigo. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about my day-to-day -day operations and what I do shortly here in a few slides. Um, but I would like to talk a little bit about my summer internships as well. The, the one thing that I did, uh, I had the opportunity to do three summer internships and I tried to diversify those internships as best as I could. So by the time it was time to accept a, a full a full time job, I had a reasonable idea of three potential avenues I could go down. So the first internship that I had was Buckman Chemicals and they're a fairly large company um, with a corporate background that deal with supplying chemicals in the paper industry. So whether that's biocides for water or retention aid for strength and paper, Buckman is a company that can, that can get those chemicals to you. Learned a lot about chemical safety, uh, personal protection in general, and how to, how to talk and communicate with customers. When, when you work for a chemical company within the paper industry, uh, you're the exact opposite of what I am now. So you're going into different mills every day. Sometimes you have three, four or five different mills 
different people, different cultures that you need to be able to understand. And this could all be within a week. It could all be within a day if things are going wrong. So your ability to deal with adversity quickly is uh, definitely something that I learned when I was working at Buckner. The next company that I worked for was Bonetti Blades. And what they do is, uh, is they cater to coder and doctor blades within the paper industry. I don't know how many paper people we have here, but basically what these blades do is over time in any process, you have huge drums that are either, uh, that are typically either carrying felts or wires that the paper will, will be on or carrying paper itself from one area to another. And what these blades do is hit the, the drum or the roller in, at a specific angle that allows to clean all of the unnecessary product that's on those rollers off of the machine and off of those rollers. So that was really unique in the sense that it was kind of like Buckman in the sense that you're in different mills, you're in different places, you're talking to different people, but you're dealing with a whole different product and you're, you're just opening your mind to, to an area of the industry that most of us probably wouldn't even know existed. I know I had heard the term coder and doctor blade, but I didn't really understand how big of a deal it was in the paper industry until I had three months to experience what it was all about. Um, the one thing that I'd like to talk about too, that I'm sure that a lot of the people uh, that are watching this have either gone to or potentially will be going to is the ability to utilize your time at school to take advantage of the trips that UWSP has set up. So I didn't get to go to Tree Haven. I'm, I'm sure we, I hope that we have a, a couple forestry majors here, but I heard Tree Haven is an incredible experience. Um, I heard that, uh, that it's just a really good time. You learn a ton and you come back a different person. And, and I think that that's awesome. From, from our side, from the chemical engineering and paper science side, we have PaperCon and Student Summit, which is pretty much the same thing as Tree Haven in the sense that you get to go, you get to just get flooded with so much information and meet so many industry professionals that that it's it's just such a great way to network in in a week or two weeks or however long the the opportunity or field trip so to say lasts but i think that if any of you guys are on the fence of of wanting to do something like that the answer is yes 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 because you will not regret it in the long run being able to diversify and see different parts of of your industry So now we're getting a little bit more into the meat and potatoes of, of my talk here. So excuse me while I take a sip of water. So I'd like to talk a little bit about BPM ink. BPM ink is a specialty paper mill. Um, what does that mean? In a nutshell, that means that we can take specialty jobs that you're bigger companies cannot. We can be profitable by taking a smaller specialty volume than a bigger company can. So the markets are slightly different. Some of the, some of the different types of products that we have and that we, we create here at BPM is candy packaging. Uh, I can't talk about specific companies, uh, but I can tell you if you've ever had a dumb dumb sucker, we make the wrappers. If you've ever had a cough drop, chances are we made we made the wrappers. Uh, if you've ever seen or or had any type of of sliced cheese that you get from the deli or you get from e even prepackaged, there's a reasonable chance that we made the we made the wrappers. So, uh, that was one thing that was neat for me is is, I guess. I said, okay, I'm going to a smaller paper mill. I, I won't really ever see, see our products out there. Well, the truth is I kind of see our products every day. So it's rewarding to know that you're, we're putting, putting something out into the, into the community, um, into the country that, and, and we take pride in what we do here.
Um, we have two machines here. So one of our machines is uh, more of a lightweight machine. That's kind of where your candy packaging, your cheese and meat interleave is. And, and it, I briefly touched on it, but the cheese and meat interleave is what would go between multiple slices of cheese, like a wax paper. And the same thing with like frozen burgers. That's, uh, that's what an interleave is. On our other paper machine, um, that's more of a, of a heavyweight material. So one of the big ones that, that we do a lot of paper and, and make a lot of paper is our reply card. So anytime you get anything in the mail that already has a stamp that you can just sign your name, write your information and return it, that usually comes from us. And we also do on that machine a fair amount of colored paper and construction paper. So this is, as you could imagine, a much thicker, uh, just overall more intense and heavy process as you move down each of these machines. Uh, one of the really unique things about BPM is that we can see our products through from the beginning to the end of the process. So here at BPM, we have two paper machines, we have three wax machines, and we also have multiple winders. What's unique about us is that just down the road, about 20 minutes away, we own another building that's our BPM O'Connell Falls, and we have two printing presses there. So a customer can come into us and say, okay, we want this type of paper with this type of print with this kind of wax formula to do this type of job. And we can say, okay, we can do all that for you. So it's one of our ways of, of creating a, a cost, effective, cost effective benefit for our customers. And we're one of the very few that can actually do that. You, you have some people that have, they may have waxers and converters, but they don't have the paper machine or they have the paper machine, but they don't have the waxers and the converters or they have the paper machine, the wax or the converters, but they don't have the printing press. So being able to, to have a one-stop shop as a company is definitely something that we're excited about because there's few and far in between. So uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what I do on a day-to-day -day basis and really just give you guys a, a day or a few minutes, I guess, in, in my shoes. So what I do is, is I, I help with managing the wax department here at BPM. So I, I kind of started on the, on the paper machine in my internship. And as personnel started to shift, I found a very comfortable and, and way to progress and move up in, in the wax department. So Kind of my day-to-day -day operations um, of what I do is is purchasing materials. So one of the the, the main material that I purchase is wax. Uh, we have multiple different types of wax depending on what our customer needs, and these are not being ordered in in hundred or two hundred pound increments. These are coming in at, at 40, 000, 45 thousand pounds of wax at a time, just to give you an idea of of how much of this wax we're going through, it, it, it's a lot. And uh, one of the most important parts to, a, to ordering these types of materials is understanding the markets. I, I mean, just in this past year with, with how, uh, how, how businesses have, have shut down, have, have started up, how oil has changed in, in price over time, directly impacts the paraffin market because paraffin is a derivative from uh, petroleum refining. So it's, it's something that we have to take a look at every day and, and we have to say, okay, we're probably gonna get a cost increase from, from this side of our market, okay, or this, our, this side of our materials. What can we do to counteract that? How do we, how do we look at our, our full process and, and and keep a competitive price for our customers while still having to manage this price increase. And, and on the opposite side, there's, there's okay, well, the market's going down now. 
what what's a way that we can we can manage effectively and create uh, potentially a better price for our customers and 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 keep them coming back and, and create that relationship where it's a it's a transparent relationship. Um, so so the purchasing of materials is is something that I, I spend a fair amount of time on every day and just making sure that you know we're working with our vendors to to get the best price and and create the best relationship for everybody involved. Uh, the, the second part of my job and probably my favorite part of the job is the product development. So I, I lead a product development team here and it's really unique because customers will come to us and, and they'll say, and I, I kind of briefly touched on this before, but they'll ask us if we can make this product. Maybe they'll send us uh, some sheet samples and that's usually where it starts. So if it's a wax product, usually what I'll do is I'll, I'll take it downstairs to our lab. I'll run a few different tests to figure out how much wax is actually on this product. Uh, how much wax is on the surface versus driven into the sheet. What type of twisting capabilities does this product have? Can, can I twist this paper around something and, and it'll, it'll hold its twist or, or will it kind of start to unravel? Um, sometimes we look at water vapor transmission rate. Can this, can this hold out humidity or hold in humidity? Um, what can it stretch? What breaking point? What's its terror? Um, there's there's so many things that we just immediately start and look at, and that's when the paper's waxed. The the really unique part is even taking it a step farther and saying, okay, what did these people that made this sheet put into their paper? What type of wood did they use for their pulp to create? Uh, this 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 burnish that allows this paper to act in this manner, and that's definitely the thing that I geek out on the most is kind of reverse engineering back and and seeing if we can make a product. Um, and sometimes you don't get that opportunity to get a get a, a product that's already made. Sometimes we're starting from scratch and and we're sitting together in a group and and just saying, okay, this is what we know. We have. We have knowledgeable people all around this table. How can we achieve creating this product? And, you know, getting back to the PowerPoint here, one of the most important things is being able to say no or yes, we can't or can make this product. So understanding our internal process limits and also our process strength is something that we have to take into consideration for every new product that that comes into our facility because if because obviously you want to be able to make every product that comes here but if your paper machine can't handle it or or your your wax machines can't handle it we have to be able to say no to ensure that our business stays viable um another another key to all of this is meeting customer expectations. And I, I think I briefly just touched on that, but being able to just get a customer a product is one thing, but being able, being able to tailor it specifically for them is something that we pride ourselves on. And it's something that we can do, as I stated earlier, because we're specialty mill. We can say, okay, company A needs this, Company B needs this, just tweaked a little bit different. And the one of the last things that we deal with on our product development side is our continuous improvement to our process. And this can be, this is a very general statement. This can be anything from, from improving safety for our operators and our guys on the floor by having automated unwind stands or rewind stands but this can also be the addition of large capital equipment. If you want to get new coders or you want to use a different type of bar that can, or roller that can potentially put more or less wax on the sheet. Uh, these are all things that we talk about every day. And, and we have meetings about, and we prioritize what is the, what is the next most important thing that we can put, you know, in our process that'll generate more business and keep more people safe. So 
what I like to talk about now is some of the things that I've noticed and other people have noticed in in our industry. And the first thing I I just put this in a few days ago, but I, I was on my iPhone and I was scrolling through my iPhone and I said, well, what's what's that app? I I don't even know that I had this app. And it was a it was a brown box. I said, oh my gosh, that's that's Amazon. And I thought it was really fitting for this presentation because to to see a to see a a huge uh, international company like Amazon use a brown paper box for their branding or their marketing, I think really speaks volumes about how rapidly this industry is changing. I mean, that is kind of what Amazon is identifying as saying, hey, we will ship you these products in this type of packaging. So it's um, it's something that we've seen for a long time uh, well, over the past 10, 15 years of corrugated board, cardboard box, always growing. And it's to the point now where you see a, a, a brown paper box on your, on your phone for an app icon and it's one of the biggest companies in the world. So I thought that was a unique little tidbit that I could I could pass on. Um, after speaking with our envi our environmental side, uh, our envi environmental personnel here, uh, there has been a tremendous increase in environmental focus over the past 15 to 20 years. Um, so in 2009, we started something called a Save on Energy Now program. And we were given 20 years to reduce our energy per ton by per ton of paper by 20%. And fortunately, we were able to accomplish this in, in five years. So um, that's just one thing that we've done as a company to show that we care about our environment and we care about the things that we discharge that come out of our, our stacks. And we care about the people around here. We care about the air quality and, and we care about the water quality. So that was wonderful from an energy perspective. Uh, the conservation of water as well is something that you'll see across the board, paper mills and, and any type of company in our industry will always be looking at how can we use water to the point where we can no longer use it anymore? Not only is it good from a environmental standpoint, being able to reuse this water, but it's also good from an economic standpoint because every time you're pumping in new fresh water into your facility, somebody's paying for it. And so being able to be environmentally conscious enough to, uh, to reuse water that you've already pulled from your main lines or your city lines is always something that should be considered and that we consider here on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, one thing that we've seen really start to come into the industry over the past probably two, three years is this concept of verifying our so verified sourcing. So what that means is that we have this piece of paper that we've made and we want to be able to go back and be able to source that every ingredient that's in this paper all the way back to the forest that it came from, the forest that this pulp came from, ha has been harvested in an in a ethical way, which is great because it allows, it allows us to know that we're getting verified products that, and, and, and these companies are giving to us what they said they were. And it's also great for, their, for our customers because we can use this, this certification, this verification to say, hey, you don't need to go out of your way to market these types of products. We already know based on the things that we've put in that what you're getting is what we say it is. And um, one of the other things that I've seen personally, and I've got many phone calls about this, is the switch from paraffin wax, like I said, we do a lot of wax products here, to soy, vegetable, and bio-based waxes. Uh, this is a really unique thing, and I'm really hoping that we can start to get some, some different types of waxes in here and, and be ready, because the 
over in Europe, this is already starting to occur. Uh, typically speaking, Europe is a little bit more forward when it comes to the environmental side. So they're already starting to get these vegetable, get these soy-based waxes, get these bio-based waxes into full-scale production. And so I think that it's really important for all of us with a sustainable mind to, to begin to start thinking of a new normal as far as the types of products and paper products specifically that we're gonna see moving forward. Um, you can also see that paper products are beginning to eliminate certain plastic products. I know even at Stevens Point, I wanna say two years ago, we started getting the box water and you're not completely eliminating all plastic because there's probably some sort of poly coating on the inside or, or something of that sorts, but we're starting to move in the right direction. You're starting to see um, the, the same thing with microwavable dinners is what used to be a plastic film is now a some sort of paper or a combination with paper and poly flexible packaging. So things are starting to progress towards definitely a more paper oriented packaging world. And due to time constraints, we can move forward. Um, one thing that I would like to would like to talk about that I think are very relevant is the the toilet paper and the, the personal care market. Um, this is really unique because we said when when this whole COVID thing, um, this this pandemic started to occur, we, we saw this huge uh, this huge demand for for uh, for toilet paper, right? Uh, it was flying off the shelves like crazy and. And I just wanted to offer some insight into the, the industry as a whole, because yes, for, for household industries, toilet paper was flying off the shelves. And, and one might think, oh my gosh, this is just the, the paper industry is going to the roof. Well, you know, we still have to take into consideration all of the, the, the restaurant orient, oriented uh, toilet paper, napkins, placemats, coasters that weren't being sold during this time. And so while one might think that there's this huge uh, increased toilet paper type paper demand, you have one side going up and you have one side going down. So there were companies that could not keep up with demand and in toilet paper. And there were also toilet paper companies that had to shut down because they had no business. So I, I guess that's just a way to, to give some insight about, about different types of markets that are that that we might uh different types of markets that that are occurring in our industry and and how it's not always how it seems if if you just look at it from a general view you you really need to dive in and and take a look at uh from a three 360 degree perspective at, at all the different moving parts of the industry and uh, in a little bit of a different way, our, our cardboard or our corrugated board industry ha have sh has shown a, a completely different trend. I mean, for the last 15 years or so, all you've seen due to online ordering is a consistent growth in those types of markets. So um, there's different sectors within the paper industry and, and based on consumer needs, uh, how, how we move forward. Um, Will, will be completely dictated by what our customers want. Um, I know I briefly touched on it in the last slide, but uh, water bottles, microwavable dinners, and uh, I just got this information about a month ago, but Smarties Candy is looking to move away from film and into paper products, at least for a few of their lines. So you could see a huge candy company like that that's been around for so long is, uh, is starting to starting to change their outlook on how they want to package their products, and um, and I think another important point is to say that sustainability and being eco friendly is not free from a from a company standpoint. As much as it would be amazing if being eco friendly and sustainable were free. The fact of the matter is it's not. There's a reason why plastic has been packaging, uh, part of the packaging world for so long. 
it's cost effective for companies. So, you know, we're we're in this in this time in in the industry where ethics really start to come into play and different companies can have different ethics based on on how they want to move forward. So I, I think it's just something to take into consideration when we talk about the paper industry that when you see uh, companies that are using recyclable or they're using sustainable or or clean source goods, I think it's important for all of us to understand that they're not necessarily getting a deal or a cost break by doing that. They are potentially spending more money to get uh, a recycled or a or a sustainable product. So I think it's something to to take into consideration for all of us. Um, and again, the, this this changing industry. I, I was talking to our 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 general manager the other day, and he basically said the 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 paper companies used to control the industry in the sense that okay, we're going to make this product, and and our customers are going to use it, and this is what we're gonna to stick to. We're gonna make it, they're gonna use it and life will go on. Well, over the past years, I guess there's been a change in the sense that this is a way more customer driven market. Uh, our capabilities as a paper company and throughout the industry have, have increased and the customers understand that now. So rather than them asking us what we can give them, they tell us what they want. And it's actually created uh, a great uh, a great situation because now we can really cater to what a customer needs and and help them achieve their packaging or or, or paper needs. And as I just said, this is something that's changed. This is new in the paper industry where really the customers do dictate and control the market. And just to wrap up here. Um, the, the future of the industry, the paper industry, I, I would say that it looks bright. I think that there is changes that are occurring, some of them that we've talked about and, and, and some of them that I haven't touched up touched on. But what I would like to kind of leave you guys with is that this is definitely a, a consumer and a, a customer driven industry now where, where people are going to tell us what they want and we will hopefully be delivering that. Um, this is going to be, there's going to be increased packaging needs from a paper perspective, especially as regulations change. I mean, all the way up to, to uh, the, the tip top of our government, uh, one bill signed can completely change the, the two year, the five year, the 10 year outlook for what will happen in the paper industry. So I think from a paper maker's perspective, it's just important to be ready for those obstacles and challenges. And uh, I think there is going to be much more innovation when it comes to paper as we know it. Uh, pushing, the, pushing the boundaries of paper, what we can make with paper or the addition of, of paper and something else. But I think that the end goal is to create a cleaner and more sustainable future for the next generations to come. So with that, I say thank you very much and appreciate you guys listening and can open this up to questions for a little bit. Excellent. I would like to thank you very much, Omar, for joining us today. And you know, you would be hearing a round of applause right now, but unfortunately, you know, just we're on, I mean, you could, yeah, we got little hand clap emojis, but but yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I, you know, this was actually really fascinating. I know very little about paper science and chemical engineering. And I, I honestly have never in my life thought about like the little pieces of paper co that come between cheese slices, like where those come from. I, it, like that those are like a specialty product. It never ever, ever occurred to me. So like, I'm like, I'm going to look at that differently next time. But anyways, um, so there are a couple of questions. Um, and so for those of you that are here, um, please feel free to enter your questions in the chat um, and we will, or if, if, or we could, you could possibly uh, do a hand raise and we could potentially unmute you for a second if that's something you desire. Um, but I'll start by reading these questions off. Um, this one's from Scott and he asks, uh, I have heard that with the decline in newspapers and newsprint, specialty paper is what saved the Wisconsin paper industry. Is this accurate? So 
that's um that's a unique unique question I, I i think that the way that i would i would answer this is that yes there has been a decline and in newspapers and newsprint and yes the wisconsin paper industry is doing well so i wouldn't say that it was just specifically specialty paper but overall as a whole industry we were able to adapt and change and keep people employed Okay. And so um, there's another question here from uh, Roland Gong, and he is actually asking, this is more a Stevens Point question. He's asking, have you seen any strength and or weaknesses of pointers compared to other candidates uh, at your mill? Oh, hi, Dr. Gong. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for asking a, a question and for, for watching. And thank you everybody, by the way, for watching. Um, you know what? I, I think the one really unique part about being a pointer is having so much access to paper mills in any direction that you go. Um, I, I know that I, I briefly touched on the, the three different opportunities I had to be able to intern. I think that directly correlates to, co correlated to my ability to come in here at BPM and hit the ground running, so to speak. So we actually do have um, a Michigan Tech graduate, Michigan Tech chemical engineering graduate here. And I wouldn't say there's necessarily any strengths or weaknesses, but we also do have one, two, three, four, five pointer alumni engineers that I could think of right now. So um, I'd say that BPM enjoys what the pointers have to offer and uh, it's, it's been great so far. Go pointers. <laughs> so, okay. So this is actually next one is is this is my question. I wasn't sure how to phrase this, but like you, you were talking about how you you take these, you know, samples that the customer provides and you know twist them and figure out like kind of exactly what what it is that the customer wants. And so once you develop something like that, are like the formulas for papers generally like kind of patented, like so that other companies can't reproduce them? Like, do you ever run into that? Like, like for example, like um. You know, I'm an artist and I do a lot of watercolor paintings and like watercolor papers are very, you can get a variety of them from different companies, but they're all slightly different. And are, so are those like, like the pulp and rag content and like the type of wood pulp and sizing and all that, are those industry secrets that they tend not to share? So I think that's a, a great question. And um, the answer is they are not patented, but they are kept secret. Um, in, in most mills that you go to, uh, there's certain things that you will be shown and there's, and there's certain things that you won't depending on where you fit in in the industry. So uh, I, I would say in, in some form, I guess you could say they're, they're patented, but not literally, but people just, they don't wanna give away that little secret. And, and I'm sure that kind of works the same way with, with what you're talking about with the paints, I, I'm sure most of the information is out there on on how to get there but one or two things is kind of kept secret and that's why you see your differences in in your paint and it's uh kind of the same in the paper industry i just seem to recall uh yeah karen uh telling me that there was some history in the paper science and chemical engineering um department and or discipline at uwsp that they had developed some uh, art paper for the art program based on like some some you know paper that was brought in and they're like hey we need to this is a cost prohibitive thing for students for our art students can we make something like this for our art students and so it was a unique part I'm, I'm I wish she was here because I'm sure that's not entirely accurate but I know that something like that was in the history of the very neat so anyways um so Scott says uh, can you tell us the status of the Verso Mill in Wisconsin Rapids? I understand this has had an impact on the pulp market, and I have some pulp and cut to or some pulp to cut and sell. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Um, specifically, I I cannot tell you of the status um, of the Verso Mill in Wisconsin Rapids, but I can tell you that the pulp market has been absolutely on fire right now. Um, there's been increases. Um, and th this is this is 
general information, you, you'd you be able to look up uh, these prices uh, for pulp per ton or bale by yourself. But the there's been increases in the industry right now that some people have never seen just how drastic the increases have occurred. Um, and it's, you you know, it's with, with the pandemic and, and, and everything going on, it's, it's, it's unique because some, this will put all of these price increases that, that are occurring right now with everything going on will definitely, I think, push companies to the limit. And in some senses, just make companies think outside of the box and in, in, in different ways and find ways to innovate and create new opportunities for themselves to uh, to thrive, uh, maybe in some cases stay afloat. Um, but it's the way that I look at it is it's just another another opportunity to battle adversity and overcome it. Um, you know, and this follows up with my pulp question. Um, about six years ago or so, the, the price on red maple pulp was very high. And I'm just curious why, what's special about red maple? And I asked that because I have a fair amount of red maple and I'd love to see that market go back up. And, and I don't know if it is or not, but how, why is, well, what is red maple used for in particular? And why was it so high? So I am actually not sure. And I am not afraid to say that I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's cool. <laughs> but what I, what I can tell you is that the, based on what consumers want, different trees, different pulp will definitely generate a different product in the long term. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, uh, a, a northern softwood versus uh, a southern softwood have different lengths and fibers. So, so you'll kind of get the, the same general, uh, general characteristics However, if you're looking for something that can twist more, you, you would potentially want to go with something that actually grows in the South. So um, I think that what your best option is, is to hang on to that red maple. And hopefully the, the consumer trends will, will turn around and that'll be worth tons and tons of money for you. All right, sounds good. Thank you. So I, I am gonna, um... I'm going to stop the recording in a minute here, but I did just, just wanted to wrap up with just saying a, a final formal thank you again so much for coming. Thank you for having us. This has been very informative and very interesting. So thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Omar. And it was uh, it was fun to have young, one of the younger crowd on and, uh, and yet to, to be able to learn a lot about paper science in your presentation. So I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate you guys.